Well, good evening, everyone. And welcome to the Royal Society of Edinburgh's Curious event um, for tonight. My name is Sam Alberti. I'm Director of Collections at the National Museum of Scotland. I'm also affiliated to the University of Stirling. But tonight I'm here as a Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and a keen supporter of the Curious programme, which will be going on um, until the 17th of September. This event about proactive repatriation work of for ancestral remains in Scotland um, is just one of a range of talks, tours, workshops and exhibitions on this year's theme, which is Under the Surface. Under the Surface encourages us to delve deeper, to question further and to look again. And this is just what we're gonna be doing in this evening's event. So our topic for this evening is repatriation. That is the physical or legal return of something held in a museum to another country, often, but are not always because of the significance of the material to the originating community, often not always because of the circumstances of its original acquisition, which is often, but not always, in a colonial context. For some organizations, this has been part of good collections development practice for decades. Others, as you may know, are a little more resistant. But to talk about recent practice in Scotland, we've got four excellent speakers from different organizations with different perspectives. I'll introduce them each briefly and then hand over to the first speaker. She'll be Nicole Anderson, a social anthropology doctoral researcher at the University of Edinburgh, who's looking at the university's anatomical museum. She'll be followed by Malcolm McCallum, who is curator of that anatomical museum, followed then by Neil Curtis, who runs museums and special collections at the University of Aberdeen. Neil's been involved in repatriations of various kinds for, for 20 years now. Finally, Kara Krampotic teaches museum studies at the University of Toronto, where her research focuses on collections management and of course, repatriation. So first and foremost, uh, first, first and foremost, Nicole Anderson will begin with five minutes on her work at the University of Edinburgh. Nicole. Hi everyone, and thank you Sam for that introduction and thank you to the RSC for having us here today. Um, I'm joining you today online from what's now called Vancouver, but for thousands of years has been the territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I'm on land today that has never been ceded, which means it's never been given up to the government or covered by a treaty, so it, it continues to be uh, stolen land. And although today I'll be talking about the repatriation of ancestral remains and decolonizing museums uh, kind of more broadly, it's a um, good time to remind us ourselves that decolonization is not a metaphor, um, but uh, it's, uh, in the words of Eve Tuck and Kei Wayne Yang, it has very lived and real um, implications for Indigenous folks today. And that the return of stolen ancestral remains and the return of stolen land are two interconnected struggles um, that seek to recognize Indigenous sovereignty and also remind us that colonialism is still current and on and an ongoing process. And, um, it's also a good time to remind ourselves about our responsibilities when we witness and learn about um, kind of instances of colonial violence and injustice and think about how we can enact our obligations as, as accountable witnesses too. So in particular, in thinking about these obligations, I'll be talking about my doctoral research, which concerns a collection of um, ancestral remains or human remains that are being held in the University of Edinburgh's Anatomical Museum or what is called uh, the Skull Room. So in this room, there are nearly 1,700 um, people, the, remain, the cranial remains of nearly 1,700 people that have been collected from 55 countries across the world um, by Sir William Turner, who is an anatomy professor and actually also a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, and he collected these people by asking his graduate students working in the colonies to send him back uh, skulls by any means necessary. So these people were illicitly acquired and they were often dug up from uh, burial grounds or graveyards or stolen from battlefields, which creates this issue that many descendant families and, and nations, indigenous nations may not know that their ancestors are, are in Edinburgh today. 
And although the university has a long history of repatriation, which uh, Malcolm may speak on further, traditionally this is operated on a reactive basis. So what this means is that the university, the museum is very happy to um, facilitate these requests and uh, is very um, uh, happy to conduct uh, repatriation, but only if communities uh, come first and put forward a, a claim. Um, so this paradox is created in that uh, descendants can't make requests if they don't know that their ancestors um, have been taken or that or that they are in Edinburgh today. So as part of my doctoral research, I have been working with Cara and Malcolm and my supervisor, John Harris, to think about changing this, this problem and how to um, share knowledge in a more proactive manner and have the institution reach out first to communities and um, disclose that we may have their ancestors in, Ed in Edinburgh. And we've been doing this primarily with communities and nations in what's now called Canada um, and uh, contacting First Nations and Inuit communities there. So a big part of this work and of my research was to gather the provenance of this people. So this term refers to any information relating to where this person came from and how they got came to be um, into the museum. And it involved looking through um, archival documents at the in the university archives. So letters between Turner and collectors or minute books from the anatomy department or old catalogs and trying to uh, piece together the, the life history and biography of these people in order to find out um, who their contemporary descendants may be. Um, and for some of these people in the skull room, they had uh, stronger provenance than others. So for example, there's, there's one person in the collection and the only thing we know about them is that they were uh, found under a floorboard in British Columbia. But in BC, there's 277 First Nations, which will, makes it difficult to affiliate this person. But for others, the provenance was stronger. So um, there would be a specific geographical location mentioned in the archival documents or even a, a coordinate in some instances um, that, that tells us from, uh, the place from which they were stolen. And affiliating these ancestors in this way and understanding where they're from is extremely important because for each person in the room, um, their families or their communities will have a very different idea of what care or justice would look like for, for this person. And it's important to note that repatriation may not always be appropriate for, for each community. And we can't just simply send back all of these people because this collection is too uncomfortable for us um, to, to, to have. Uh, for some communities don't handle deceased um, people, or like I mentioned, the provenance of some of these people is too poor. So repatriation might not always be the best um, course of action. But the only way to know the best approach and best practices of care is to be able to ask. So my project um, has been uh, has involved outreaching to some of these communities through letters and later Zoom meetings and ensuring um, the descendants were part of these discussions um, from as early as possible and um, for them to have knowledge about their ancestors um, being here. Um, and a big part of this work was also thinking about how to share this information in a sensitive and caring and, and humanizing way because it's very could be very difficult knowledge to receive that your that their ancestor was, was taken um, under these kind of violent um, violent conditions. Um, and so through this um, through this work and thinking about our accountability as members of the university, changing to th this proactive approach and moving beyond these feeling of kind of guilt or shame or anger, which can be sometimes kind of unproductive feelings to undertake actionable work um, is creating this new process of proactive knowledge sharing that could hopefully be replicated with other ancestors in the collection from different countries. And part of this work was also to ensure that there's enough funding available to do this because the university, even though it was responsible for stealing these people in the first place, will not fund repatriations to communities. So uh, kind of the next steps in this work too is to ensure that this work continues and maybe pressuring the, the wider institution to be more concerned about its colonial legacies in ways that actually matter and going beyond simply acknowledging that these violences happened in the past, but to see that they're still ongoing and that um, more funding is needed to, um, to repair these injustices and ensure that some of these ancestors can make their way home in the future. Um, and I'll pass on to Malcolm just now, who's going to speak further on the Anatomical Museum. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so yeah, my name is Malcolm. I'm the curator of the Anatomical Museum. 
we are very frequently confused with Surgeons Hall Museum. So just to let you know, we are based in the anatomy department of the medical school of the University of Edinburgh, and we're based at Teviot Place in the Old Town. You may be familiar with the strong historical links between the history of medicine and the university. For example, in 1705, the first professor of anatomy anywhere in the UK was appointed at Edinburgh. Our medical school goes back to 1726, and the museum dates from about 1798. My remit is really to look after this nearly 300-year-old collection of anatomy, which is probably the largest in the UK, and it includes many thousands of individual human remains. Most famously, or perhaps most infamously, we have the skeleton of the murderer William Burke. Although we do open to the public on a regular basis, our daily focus is on using the collection for academic teaching and engagement, and the museum itself is mainly a study space for our medical students. As Nicole mentioned, within the collections of human remains, there is a crania collection of 1,700 human skulls, which with a very small number of exceptions are not on public display. So why do we have these skulls? Well, during the 19th century, Edinburgh became an important centre for the study of craniometry, anatomy, comparative anatomy, anthropology, and perhaps most challengingly for us, phrenology. So this resulted in hundreds of human skulls from all parts of Scotland, the UK, and other countries around the world being gathered by both the university, but also the Edinburgh Phrenological Society. Now, the collections of the Edinburgh Phrenological Society were transferred to the anatomy department in the 1890s, and as well as life masks and death masks and brain casts, it included several hundred skulls. So the majority of these skulls, you may not be surprised to hear, were collected from Outwith, Scotland, and were taken from the colonies of what were the British Empire. So frequently, there is no specific further documentation regarding this. The individuals have almost been written out of history sometimes, but we do know that the process would have been entirely unethical. So sometimes we know the names of the skull collectors, but we very rarely know the names of the collected individuals. For the collectors of skulls, the common theme seems to me to be the British military. In lots of instances, the collectors are medical men, military men, or more likely military medical men. And quite often they're graduates of the university themselves. And if not, they're certainly known associates with the anatomy staff at the time. And Nicole mentioned Professor William Turner, whose name comes up again and again and again. So we see skulls coming from Royal Navy expeditions. We see them coming from scientific expeditions taken from battlefields or from doctors in the colonies who've got ready access to what they saw was the raw materials of their research. So they had opportunist, opportunistic opportunities, I suppose, to find skulls from prisons, asylums and hospitals. A smaller number of the skulls were actually bought at auction or were the result of archaeological digs. So some of the skulls that came in in the 19th century to the museum collection are actually dated from the 14th century. Skulls continued to come into Edinburgh until the early day, decades of the 20th century. So we do, however, have a long history of repatriation, and there have been several returns of human remains to Edinburgh back to their ancestral homelands. Our first recorded human remains repatriation was a single skull to Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka, in 1947. So in terms of Western museums is a very early example. There was a period of inactivity for about 40 years until the 1990s, when a major phase of repatriation took place to Tasmania, mainland Australia and New Zealand. And this was followed up with a second phase of returns to the Pacific Islands in the 2000s. These returns involved several hundred skulls, uh, but also sometimes postcranial remains, so the rest of the skeleton. And even in one instance, we returned a single ossicle, a, a bone of the ear, which was about two millimetres long. It's probably worth saying that the university does have a, an official pro-repatriation policy in place today, which is approved by the university court in 1990. So I see us now as being in probably the third phase of repatriations. In 2019, we returned nine skulls to the Veda people of Sri Lanka. This year, we will complete another repatriation with at least another one to come in 2024. Last year, I received, I think it was, well, I counted it up, 216 collection inquiries, approximately 75% related to the human remains in the collection. And some of these early conversations has led to repatriation processes being initiated. But, and there's a big but, as Nicole indicated, historically, we have worked reactive, re reactively, uh, waiting to be approached by communities for information. 
So what we're doing with the communities of the First Nations in Canada, and with Nicole, Cara and others in the team, is particularly unique for us. And it's something that both I and the anatomy department are delighted to be part of. And I will now hand you on to Neil. Um, so yes, I'm Neil Curtis. I'm um, responsible for all the museums and special collections at the University of Aberdeen. And very like the, the his, history of Edinburgh University, um, Aberdeen is another of the ancient universities of Scotland and has been um, acquiring collections you know, since the very earliest years. It had a museum um, likewise established in the 18th century. Um, one of the differences, however, is that um, while a lot of the collections in Edinburgh University subsequently were transferred to be one of the founding collections of the National Museums, um, Aberdeen still has that um, wide range of collections from um, the local archaeology and history, world culture, zoology, geology, um, anatomy, that really broad spread uh, of material. But I think it, it reflects the history of, um, of Aberdeen, of the northeast of Scotland, as well as the university. So there's um, a lot that is about the locality. Um, and then there are the collections that were formed in the growth of um, collecting sciences in the 19th century. So disciplines like botany and zoology and geology and archaeology, and not least anatomy. Um, and the anatomical collections um, were uh, built in the, the ideas of race that uh, formed in the 19th century. So people were trying to gather collections that demonstrated the variety of humanity with a, a, a racial approach. Um, and then we, we have, um, I suppose associated with that, is other material that was collected by graduates of the university who took advantage of the opportunities of the British Empire to work all over the world. And so the university now has um, a collection of, I say, about 300,000 items, a really wide, wide range. Um, we're thinking about returning, and I think there are various different words we can use, repatriation, return, restitution, but um, the, my first experience um, was in 2003, when the university received a request from the, the Kainai, the, the blood tribe in Western Canada, for the return of a sacred bundle. And that was indeed re returned uh, that very, very quickly, really. Um, but I think that has really changed the way I've been thinking about collections. I started as um, a, an archaeologist thinking about um, Scot the Scottish past. And so I had to start thinking about other ways of looking at the world um, and respecting and listening to, to different people. For the return itself, the university developed a procedure um, and this was something that we, we learned a lot from other institutions, Edinburgh University and particularly actually Glasgow Museums who had uh, returned the ghost dance shirt uh, a number of years previously. And we now have um, a procedure and this is one that um, tries to be open, tries to encourage discussion um, and is really just a framework for thinking through the issues uh, that come with a proposal to, to return something or indeed somebody. Um, so I think it's something that has had a huge personal impact in the way I think about what museums are. Um, and I think some of the cases we've been, uh, been involved in have, have also had a, a wider impact on, on how you know, museums think about themselves. We've had a small number of other um, cases over the years, including ancestral remains. Um, but most famously, uh, recently, a couple of years ago, the university returned the Benin bronze to Nigeria. That was different in two respects. Um, one was that the, the reason for return was quite simply it was returning stolen property. So in some ways there was very little discussion. It was something the university didn't have moral title to. But I think more strikingly, it was the first time that the university had taken the first step, had been proactive in, in returning. Um, and so we've reviewed our procedures and now we're thinking, how do we uh, address that legacy that we have, what obligations do we have, what should we be doing? And as Nicole was saying at the start, it's not straightforward. You don't want to impose this on, on other people just to make ourselves feel good about it. It's a very complicated um, story. But what it's about is really trying to think much more, trying to understand different viewpoints, and fundamentally about shifting the power from the museums to other people around the world. So on that, I'll pass over to Cara. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Good evening, everyone, and it's a real pleasure to be here. 
Um, the folks in the room are more expert at Scottish repatriation than I am, uh, though I'm glad to be part of it. Um, instead, I'll sort of um, think a little bit internationally about this moment in repatriation. And, you know, at a surface level, one of the things we often read about or hear about in the media is this idea that repatriation is a loss, right? It will be a loss to museums. They will lose their collections and science will lose opportunities for knowledge and the public will lose access to an important part of human heritage. Um, and what I have found as a repatriation scholar is that this concern about loss is surprisingly short-sighted. When we indeed go under the surface and when we deepen our understanding of repatriation and look at the evidence, uh, especially from the last 30 years, but even quite longer, that deeper history of repatriation that Malcolm spoke to, um, what we, you know, what we should see is that repatriation is, I would argue, a creative practice or a generative practice. Repatriation contributes to the creation of belonging. It contributes to cultural expression, knowledge, and understanding. And all of these are at the core of contemporary museum practice. And so from a museum perspective, then, I would say we should be leaning into and not shying away from repatriation. Right. Um, repatriation, its origins come from this idea of returning someone or something to their homelands. And we apply this term to cultural heritage, but also to refugees and the war dead. And at its heart, then, this is a word that understands that displacement creates hardship and ruptures. And so requests for repatriation, for restitution, even for rematriation, are really um, requests to return something or someone home, right? And, and when people speak of repatriation as a loss to museums, they're sort of ignoring the fact that the loss has already happened, right? And these requests are to bring home, right? And to restore. Where home is, and who identifies with that home can be very complex uh, and multifaceted. And I don't wanna be naive about that. But one of the things that's become uh, very clear is that in the case of museums and colonial metropoles, the museum, its staff and its activities rarely resemble home, right? For ancestral remains, cultural patrimony and even mundane cultural belongings, everyday objects, the museum experience of being accessioned, cataloged, numbered, stored, curated, researched, interpreted, exhibit uh, can really deviate significantly from those objects or human remains pre-museum lives. There are, of course, instances where museum and staff do more closely resemble home, uh, where that geographic and cultural distance between artifact, collection, institution, and staff is not so great. Um, and this is actually a really useful time to remember that when we talk about repatriation, museums are not only the institutions that return, they are also often institutions that receive and that grow through repatriation. Museums are very frequently the recipient of repatriated materials uh, and repatriated ancestors. So we might think about the Haida Gwaii Museum, the Umista Cultural Center, even the National Museum of the American Indian, which were all born out of repatriation processes. What we see is often when communities are seeking return, when nations are seeking repatriation, they are desiring, caring, and collective spaces for those belongings, for those relatives. And what they create are often museum and museum-like spaces where they can enact local practices of care, knowledge sharing, and history making, right? So this moment of proactive repatriation is really exciting um, on many levels. It is this generative moment um, where museums are actually coming to understand their collections better. Um, the provenance research, of course, that Nicole spoke about, uh, that Neil spoke to, the sort of community work that happens, that building of trust and understanding through the work of repatriation, it can often carry over into conservation 
uh, into curatorial and educational collaborations. And there's this um, improved ability on the part of museums to interpret and understand the collections they care for and the cultures and the individuals that those collections represent. On the flip side, of course, we see nations and communities when, when repatriation happens, these are often woven into their narratives and sense of self. Um, and so we see again, this creative moment where the return of Sarah Bartman, for example, is now part of San history. And it's told at the University of Witzwatersand, Sarah Bartman's return is her repatriation is part of that sense of history and sense of nationhood. We see um, in other instances to this sort of idea of a duty of care uh, that comes about on both sides in repatriation work. And it's um, Malcolm who's made this observation really quite powerfully. Um, he, in one of our meetings, he said, we have a duty of care to the individuals in our collection. And we also have a growing awareness of being global citizens. Right. So in this instance, this creative aspect of repatriation, we can understand it as an evolving way that museums are enacting those duty of care and engaging in the very process of repatriation itself. So I'd love for folks in the audience to think about the ways in which repatriation is generative. It helps us develop our understanding of cross-cultural diplomacy, of governance and law. It enriches our understanding of spirituality, animacy, and agency. It raises our understanding, improves our understanding of cultural expressions of kinship and grief and mourning and responsibility and care, and those interrelationships between the tangible and the intangible. And I would argue that when museum staff and boards, museum boards, grow their understandings in their area, in these areas, their capacity to care for curate and interpret and activate collections for our publics, for diverse publics, really improves. Thank you. Well, thank you, Karen. Thank you to all of our uh, contributors who will be joining us in the digital room um, just now for uh, the more discuss disc discursive element um, of the session, which I think is uh, uh, most welcome. And I'd like to thank you all for your um, pithiness, which allows us for a good generous time before our uh, Zoom will cut us all off at 1900 um, on the nose. Um, I'd encourage all of you uh, to, um, uh, all of you participating in the, in the session and in the, um, in the Zoom, uh, uh, Zoom sphere to drop your uh, questions in the Q&A. Um, and I can uh, relay them to the to the panel and open ended questions most welcome to either to a specific speaker or to the panel as a whole. It may be that some of uh, the contributions from the room are quite specific, in which case we're recording all of the questions and insofar as we can, we'll forward to the appropriate panelist or colleague um, and get back to you by email, but please do um, drop your questions in. I have a couple to get us rolling and I found all uh, the contributions very uh, thought provoking. I was uh, interested that although we are all one way or another university or museum um, uh, people, uh, uh, we um, we show different perspectives and from different different places. Now, the two questions I have to kick off, just to give you a heads up, folks. Second question is about provenance research. So start thinking about that. Um, but the first is, is something that I come around to again and again. Um, there's a truism that uh, repatriation is not a loss, or as you said, it's not a loss, not the loss of an object or some remains, but the gaining of a friendship and a relationship. Now that's a bit trite, which is the way I like it, but I would welcome thoughts or reflections or experiences the panel have on what has happened afterwards, on instances you know about or you've been involved in, when there has been, you know, either a good experience or otherwise of a continued relationship that was born of um, that initial request that came in. Um, Neil, perhaps, can I go to you first and then the others, um, given your, your experience in this field? Okay. Um, 
I was hoping somebody else was going to come in and I could then disagree with them. Um, <laughs> I I have very mixed feelings about this. I can give uh, an example the um, that first um, return that we're involved with, with to the Kai and I. Um, the purpose of that was returning a sacred bundle to them for them and it wasn't about uh, it, it wasn't really about us gaining anything that wasn't the intent at all um, however um, it was wonderful being contacted a sort of year or so afterwards by the person who was looking after that bundle um, requesting me to help help him buy a Bonnie Prince Charlie kilt jacket so that when he was dancing the headdress um, he would wear that jacket as you know a marker of the time that that bundle had spent in Scotland so that was a, a lovely example not of us physically gaining a thing but of the way that that involvement of Aberdeen in the the, the life of that bundle was continuing um, but I am very, very wary that we mustn't start expecting relationships. It's not a, you know, it's not a contractual thing. Things may happen. Um, things may happen in very unpredictable ways. The, um, what you do with one group of people in the world, other people hear about that, and then they'll start talking to you in a different way because you're establishing your identity, who you are. So I really want to make sure that we, we don't see it as, as something um, that, we go into thinking we will benefit. I think the gains that Cara's talking about are off, you know, there are a wide range of different gains. I mean, I feel I've personally gained, gained and learned a huge amount. My perspective of the world is very different, but I wouldn't have gone into returning um, ancestors or items in the hope that I would feel better about it afterwards. Can I jump in there? I think what Neil is saying is really important, right? That when museums repatriate, they are not owed anything in return. And I think, Neil, your example of the Benin bronze is a really powerful one right here, right? And if we think about civic society, if somebody returns stole, your stolen property to you, you shouldn't be expected to have to have a relationship with them afterwards, right? Um, a wrong does not lead to a friendship. Um, and, and, you know, one of the really important things um, even when we're not talking about clearly stolen items, but um, when we're thinking about return, if we don't think about it as a loss to the museum, there's there's no need to compensate, right? Because they haven't lost anything. It's it's been a positive practice. So uh, so we sort of take away that idea that we must gain something in return because nothing's been lost in the first place. Yeah. Malcolm, did you have any thoughts on this? Um, I still think there's a huge imbalance of power when you're working with repatriation. We, the university in our case holds all the cards, so I think Cara is right. We don't want to um, expect anything out of this. I do have one um, example. When we returned nine skulls to Sri Lanka, um, the, the tribal chief, it was very nearly eight skulls we returned because the tribal chief saw our collection of skulls and wanted us to retain one of the skulls in the collection which caused me um, a, bit of, a bit of grief because of, if you know museums documentations and the, the road to the repatriation for this to happen at the very last minute. So we sort of politely said that we would like to just continue with the original repatriation and um, not for any to be left back in Edinburgh. Um, following that, they did actually invite us to Sri Lanka to have a look at the where the skulls were going to go. Unfortunately, uh, COVID interfered in that, so we didn't get a trip to Sri Lanka. But I think when we repatriate, we we don't necessarily see it as the end of the project or the you know, the the process, but we don't expect anything, um, any particular positive relationships out of it. To be honest, because we've got that weight of history, um, you know, on on our backs as well. And Nicole, yeah, just echoing what um said already, but yeah, but not having an expectation for this relationship um, to continue, but also um, I think it's important for museum professionals, uh, it could, could also be an opportunity for museum professionals to act as another link or a contact for other communities um, initiating a return, um, even though you're not expecting like this kind of ongoing friendship or relationship, just knowing that there is a, 
kind of a, a helpful person in, in Edinburgh and Aberdeen that um, has conducted repatriations before and is a uh, kind of a cooperative and collaborative person to work with could also be um, really mm. useful for other nations. Um, and uh, I guess nations speaking between each other can, um, you know, offer this information and yeah, and I guess if, you know, not gaining anything material or like tangible is, is one thing, but I suppose they're what museum folks in Scotland can also gain through like self-reflection and um, through kind of um, enacting these processes, like learning how to do repatriation or do this work in a good way. And from, I guess, from Neil and Malcolm and Cara have said that each repatriation is always different and works in a kind of case by case basis. And there's always something new to learn from each, um, from each instance. So um, I think that's something we, we can gain um, through these experiences. Uh, and Nicole, whilst you have the, the microphone, as it were, um, if I can move on to the question about provenance research, I wonder if um, uh, you could explain just for those of those who uh, maybe aren't involved in, in museum work as closely, um, what provenance research is, and mm -hmm. are you undertaking any for your for your project, or have you undertaken um, uh, any previously? Yeah, so um, that was one of the main the main um, roles in, in this project and in my doctoral research. And um, so provenance research is basically trying to figure out any pieces of information about a person's or I guess that maybe a belongings um, like life history or biography. So where, where they came from, who they were taken by, what institutions they've been in prior to coming to Edinburgh, um, just any information we have about um, yeah, how, how they got here and, and where they might have been from. So what, what this looked like is, what this looked like for me was sitting in the university archives for basically weeks and looking through um, boxes of archival material from the university or also from the Phrenological Society of Edinburgh. And these are, haven't been professionally archived before. So they're basically um, kind of in a kind of random order and looking through these catalogues or letters from Turner and collectors and trying to piece together the stories of, of these people. And, um, and then I would, I would log them kind of in, in, an, ex, in an Excel spreadsheet um, and gather all these pieces of information. But I think it's also important to think about how you present this, um, this knowledge to a, a descendant community because an, an Excel spreadsheet or like a museum catalog that has a lot of accession numbers isn't a very, sensitive or, or caring way to to um to be presented with this information so um part of the kind of outreach process and sharing this provenance research um we're thinking about how to rewrite um these histories uh in ways that were more kind of more accessible and more, more sensitive so we did kind of um i i was looking at uh the journey home project that the museum of anthropology at ubc in vancouver did with Stolo ancestors, and they rewrote their museum documentation in these kind of paragraphs um, that explained um, kind of a more humanizing way of uh, talking about the, the biographies of these ancestors and um, kind of putting in all the details that they knew about them um, in a way that was more, uh, I don't know, kind of easier to read and easier to hear because it might be quite difficult for, for some folk. But I hope that. Um, I hope that explains a bit more about what provenance research uh, might be. Nicole, that's really helpful. I think that will have enhanced uh, uh, everyone's understanding and given a, a really nice glimpse into the detail of it. I'm keen to move on to the far more challenging questions that are coming in on the Q&A, um, but just in case Malcolm, Neil or Cara, did you have anything to add on, on provenance? Neil? Yeah, I mean, I think um, three, three quick points. One is it's what museums claim to do anyway that we're meant to know what is in the collections we're caring for. Um, but actually, we don't manage because the information that we've been given is usually the information by um, the collectors who often really don't know much, didn't know much. Um, and then we don't, basically broader society doesn't give um, museums the resources to do all that documentary research that I think sometimes we've claimed that we've been able to do so that we're we've set ourselves up with you know, public expectations way beyond what's actually possible. My second point is just a, a caution about uh, 
provenance research, that it mustn't be something that becomes a block to repatriation, that you've got to sort of prove to our satisfaction with all this extra work. Um, and it shouldn't be an excuse to, you know, just get lots more museum jobs. Um, my final point is about um, whose standards are we doing this to? Um, and there's a, again, there's a danger that we can in museums start saying, you've got to prove to us that this is yours before we will let you have your stuff back. Um, and, you know, Cara made the comparison with, uh, you know, stolen property. Who you're, are you proving to the thief? Um, and I was really struck that first repatriation I was involved with, with the Kainai. Um, I confess that my first feeling when they said, can we have a photograph of it? I thought, oh, that'll mean they know what it's like. So I can't ask them to describe it. I can't do a sort of double blind test. And I realized that that was such a dreadful attitude that I'd never have restricted access to any scholar of a, of a photograph. So I realized just the sort of attitudes I was coming with. Um, and so we weren't really able to have that quasi-scientific proof of what this, who this headdress belonged to. What it actually came down to was trust. And we built that relationship where I knew that they would not have wanted somebody else's sacred bundle. Their standards of proof were much higher than ours would ever have been. And so I think understanding the, the different standards, the different ways of assessing accuracy and truth we've got to be uh, you know aware of that and alert to that in what we expect and i think we do need to do the provenance research but with those caveats now i know that Cara and malcolm have both opinions and deep experience of provenance research but on that on that note of of research i'm going to move on to our first question for the floor this one from david it's a it's a challenging one um, he observes that we'd uh, mentioned that museum collections can be valuable resources for research, but do we know of any valuable research on these collections? Is there any evidence of museum collections being used for valuable research? I'm going to go to Malcolm first, because I have a hunch you'll be able to answer this. Yeah, I mean, I would say 95% of the time, no. <laughs> um, quite often we basically are the custodians of the human remains, but we don't do anything with them. They're not on public display. We don't allow any invasive research, um, don't allow any photography, don't allow any visits. So partly no, but uh, again, going back to the Sri Lankan example, we actually did some valuable research collaboratively. We had some work done, some science, if you like, done on, on the skulls um, to show um, a diet and a location of a particular group, the VEDA, to try to help them to explain to the Sri Lankan government at the time that they were um, living on their historic hunting lands in Sri Lanka in the rainforest. And the science that was done made gave them some scientific evidence that they historically were living and hunting and eating on these historic lands, because at the time they were under pressure from the Sri Lankan government to remove themselves from the historic rainforests. So that evidence was done in association with them. They were kind of co-authors of the subsequent paper, and um, this was done before the repatriation took place. So that's a very practical example, but we didn't... Um, uh, for me, at the moment, that's still a bit of a rarity, I would say, and a lot of these collections are just there and because they've always been there, and that's it. Nicole, I wonder what your perspective on this is. Yeah, um, I guess it kind of reminds me of a conversation I had with um, Sue Rowley, who's uh, who works at again the Museum of Anthropology in, in Vancouver, and she they did at their museum. She was um, she was giving me I was asking for her for advice for my project, and she was um, saying that it's useful to anticipate what questions. Um, communities might might have about the ancestors and to um, in some ways kind of prepare for that so in her case some of the communities she was working with um, some of they wanted to know you know what did what did this ancestor 
how did they die or what did they eat and um, did they have any ailments or how old were these people and because those questions were of, of their concern it kind of and that, like it allowed or gave permission for the museum to um, discuss kind of more uh, invasive forms of research so kind of isotopic analysis or um, kind of DNA or genomic analysis are, are um, kind of more, more destructive and that kind of gave the answers to these questions. Um, so I guess in terms of kind of that type of research on ancestral remains, it's just important to um, remember that, uh, yeah, the question of kind of valuable research or, or what um, communities want to know about their ancestors needs to be done in collaboration and discussion with them first before, before you do any of this work. But, um, but yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess in, in terms of that way that it depends what research, what questions communities have, um, and that I guess that is considered valuable um, for them. Other questions are coming thick and fast, but Neil. Yeah, just I think we having collections and research on them is one of the things that museums are for, but it's not the only thing. I think the what people learn by encountering them, not you know, it may be new knowledge for them, it may not be new knowledge for other people, I think is important. The other bit is, you know, museums are places that look after a lot of the difficult stuff that we, we have in in our culture, that they're not just rational institutions for research. Um, I'm not, you know, that, that leads to a lot more complicated discussion. I'm not going to continue on that, but I think just to regard collections as a research resource is uh, is, is narrowing the potential. Well, that's great. Thank you. Um, Cara, I'm going to come to you first with the next question, which is about reparations as opposed to repatriations. Um, Alexandra uh, asks, um, or thanks us for a great, uh, the great talks. Um, and they observe while repatriation may return an object or remains to their originating community, the community still has years where they were unable to access this object or person. Very good point. This can mean the loss of cultural or familiar knowledge. What are your opinions on colonial institutions offering reparations to account for these lost years? Not merely as an apology, but as revitalization. And by reparations, I take uh, their meaning to be around. Um, you know, financial compensation for the loss. Um, Cara, do you have thoughts on that? And then I'll come to the others. Yeah, this is a great question. And, and um, it makes me think a little bit about what Neil was just saying. So uh, my hope is that in addition to sort of proactive repatriation, as we've talked about it today, that museums will come to a place where they are willing to and wanting to engage in questions of repatriation, because we understand that the item or the, particularly with cultural belongings or artifacts, um, that actually it will do more in another place and probably that place is its home community, right? In terms of inspiring artists. Um, we also see a lot of uh, really interesting and exciting work happening around uh, language revitalization. Uh, to have a robust language, a rich language, um, that is helped when you have a rich set of things to talk about. Uh, when you can delve into all of those verbs for making, all of those sensory qualities, um, all of those, you know, plants and materials and animals and, you know, symbols and, and iconography that are rich and specific to a culture. On the question of sort of financial reparations, um, there are a few museums in the world who have the financial resources to be useful in terms of financial reparations. They often seem to be the ones hesitant to repatriate. Um, you know, I, museums are generally not well-funded institutions. Um, and, and so what we have to offer in terms of reparation, um, in terms of support and resource um, resources, I think needs to draw on those wider skill sets that are in museums, things around storytelling and narrative practices. Um, you know, it, when we are up working in, in Haida Gwaii, community members, weavers, often want to talk to conservators, thinking about how do we best keep the things that we've made, right? How do we keep safe the hats that we've woven? Um, what do we do if there's a house fire, 
right? Uh, and you're far away. How do we how, how do we respond? So you know, museums have other things to offer, um, and and I actually think collections are an amazing resource that stimulate all kind of uh, cultural activity. Um, and that might be, you know, thinking creatively about how we use collections uh, might be part of this process. Anyone have anything else to add on that? Um, I, I can do. Um, I mean, I think one, one point is that this is, um, these things were taken, these people were taken not by a museum. It's a broader social responsibility we have. And so to dump all the responsibility for dealing with all of those problems on museums isn't right. We can't solve that. I think, as Cara was saying, there are particular things that museums can do. And, um, and we're involved with projects now about, um, that is revitalization and is, is not about physically returning, but is about making um, available online um, images that craft workers can work with. This is material that is Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Muskogee. We don't know exactly who, who it's associated with. So there are things that we can do, but I think to turn it into just a financial, we've got to give money back, is not big enough and yet too big for museums at the same time. Now, the Q&A doesn't get any less challenging. Um, this perhaps is more a comment than a question from Nathan, um, but I think it's a very important observation. So Nathan is a scholar of re repatriation, also based in Edinburgh. Um, and uh, Nathan is baffled as to why this panel has no representation from an indigenous perspective. On the surface, Nathan notes this may not necessarily distract from the overall goal of such a discussion, which is undoubtedly extremely interesting and stimulating. However, if we consider this matter from a broader perspective, Nathan observes it isn't reassuring. Would anyone like to comment on that? Absolutely, Nathan. And yet, one of the things we learn in equity, diversity, and inclusion work is that as a settler scholar, as a white woman, I can't ask Indigenous people to be the advocates for repatriation all the time. I absolutely have to step up uh, and be willing to voice a proactive, a pro-repatriation uh, opinion um, and encourage change from within settler institutions. Um, but you're right, it, it's a very good question. We should always be thinking uh, about who, who gets to say in these conversations, um, who's invited in, uh, and where are the other conversations happening? So where should we be going as a settler scholar? Where should I be going uh, to be the odd one out in the room where it's an all indigenous panel uh, and I'm in the audience? That's an important place to be as well. Thank you, Cara. Moving on to other uh, challenging but important matters. Uh, one anonymous attendee has asked what the what impact the recent scandal at the British Museum has had on the repatriating repatriation conversation. Now, I'm sure other uh, museum uh, workers will share the um, uh, renewed effort to understand document catalog and, and properly house our collections to render them as secure as possible. Um, but I don't know if anyone else had any specific thoughts about how uh, the British Museum's travails might uh, impact upon the repatriation um, discussion, is the question, um, specifically. I could maybe quickly jump in, and I, I threw, um, next to a point that Neil was making earlier, um, that uh, I guess one way museums can show care for the people in their collections or the belongings in their collections is making sure that their house is in order, that they're, um, they know who they have. Um, they know about, um, you know, doing as far as they can, um, getting their archival documents, provenance research, and um, their kind of, their catalog, cataloging um, kind of, we got organized in an appropriate manner so things do not go missing and things that are accounted for and that is um i guess one of the the main roles and jobs and caring for for their collections is to actually knowing who is there and and what's what's leaving and keeping good records for that and um 
something that kind of Malcolm and I speak about um, in the case of an anatomical museum is that a lot of this memory and this knowledge also kind of kind of like dies with like previous curators and when people leave institutions and it's really important to have good record keeping. Um, so some of the repatriations that happened in the early um, 2000s to Australia and New Zealand, we don't actually know that much about because um, there just wasn't good record record keeping about this. So it's a, it's a little bit um, disconcerting. Um, so in terms of just basic practices of care, that is the first thing curators um, can do is just make sure that everything is really above board and things are noted down and their um, kind of uh, technologies of, of cataloging and information keeping is, is up to date and um, yeah, and uh, legal as, as well, I guess. Well, thank you, Nicole. I think that's a, a fitting note and fitting that it comes from, from you to, um, to start to wrap up this session. There are other questions that have been posed from the floor. Um, please be reassured we will um, capture those questions and, and where we can um, answer them uh, by other media, um, as I indicated earlier. Um, but I would like to uh, mention that this, uh, re mention again that this is part of the broader Curious program, and you can find out about more events at rse-curious.com. I'd like to thank everyone for um, uh, taking your time on what is in Edinburgh, a very lovely evening, taking the time to join us for this fascinating and stimulating um, conversation that I've certainly found um, extremely um, thought provoking. But most of all, I'd like to thank Nicole, Malcolm, Neil and Cara for their time, uh, their wisdom and their, their reflections. Thank you, everyone. And good night.